Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Office Hours. I see a few people joining in the room, uh, so we'll get started in just a moment. But we've got a great agenda prepared for you guys. Lots of fantastic information that Casey and Mike are going to share over the next hour. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And I just posted a quick uh, comment in the chat, just introducing myself and reminding you that um, this next hour is all for you. Uh, lots of information to share. And if anything piques your interest or if you have a question along the way, please go ahead and drop it into the questions tab uh, and we'll be sure to answer it. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, our office hours today is four ways your F&I provider should boost your business. Um, my name is Amanda Plisco. I am on the marketing team here at JMA Group, and my role is to create content that connects JMA to our dealers and to the automotive community as a whole. Part of that means I get to work really closely with our sales and field teams like Mike and KC to share new ways we're delivering value to dealerships nationwide. Uh, Mike, Casey, would you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves? Well, good afternoon, good morning, depending uh, where you're joining us from. I'm the area sales director for the West Coast, and I work with our soon-to-be and our uh, new j &A partners, focusing on driving performance and finding new areas of profitability for them. Yes, hello, everybody. My name is Casey Zangara. I'm the director of dealer performance, covering some of the Rocky Mountain states, so Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, and El Paso. Uh, I help support six of our dealer performance managers to to help boost uh, profits and drive performance within our stores and and uh, a lot of things that we're going to be talking about today. So uh, really happy to be here. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you both for joining us. So let's jump right in. Um, just as an overview, I mean, I think we all know the tide is pretty high right now on F and I performance as a whole, and most people are wondering. Where do we go from here? Is there any way that things could possibly get better, right? So today we'll talk about some of that, some some ways that your F&I provider may or may not be thinking of to help you optimize your business on uh, some new fronts. And we'll talk a lot through the lens of that in-person training element, different process enhancements that you could benefit from, and ways to use data to identify different growth opportunities. So really, uh, today's conversation is going to be focused on four specific ways that your provider should boost your business, those being finding an F&I provider you can trust, managing objectives and driving performance, leveraging technology and digital retail tools, as well as maximizing additional income streams. So what we'd like to do is start today with a little bit of audience participation. I will go ahead and post a poll that you should see popping up on your screens right now. Uh, so the question is, which of these four ways do you see as the biggest areas of opportunity for your business? And feel free to select one or more. Uh, and we'll leave that up for just a moment so that everybody can go ahead and vote. And some numbers continuing to trickle in, but it looks like an even race so far. So uh, good to know that we're pretty on the nose with what's going on in the industry. I'll leave it up for another uh, 30 seconds or so, just so everybody can get their votes in. Again, you can select one or all uh, or anywhere in between. All right, so it looks like uh, most people have submitted their responses and it looks like the front runner is leveraging technology and digital retail tools, uh, followed very closely by the remaining three items. So um, let's go ahead and uh, move on with the presentation and we'll jump into finding an F&I provider that you can trust. Um, and I think the big element here is that difference between a vendor and a partner, right? So. Uh, Casey, do most dealers consider their F&I provider a vendor or a partner? And, and how do you go about establishing that trust and reliability that's so central to that relationship um, and really 
showing the distinction between the two? Yeah, so I think it's an important question to ask, uh, especially when Mike is out talking to some new dealers that were uh, prospecting. But we, we ask this question a lot even for our current dealers because um, it could be more of a, a vendor type relationship if that's the uh, the dealer's wants and goals where, you know, we could be a provider that handles claims and, and provides a contract and, and great service to go with that. I think the majority of our dealers that we work with, though, consider us um, a partner in the stores. And, and of course, that's going to be uh, focused on the dealer's priorities and, and helping drive performance and grow the people within the stores. Um, you know, I think we ask a lot of questions, like I said, leading up to a relationship or within it and making sure that we're working within that dealer's model and actually, you know, really uh, customizing what we can bring and our best practices that we can bring. But making sure we're still, um, you know, focused on the culture of that dealership and what they're already doing really well with. And uh, a couple of instances that I can think of that we've recently partnered up with is maybe a, a dealership that's doing one point of contact throughout the process. And, you know, we might not be doing traditional F&I training with three or four different F&I managers. Maybe it's a, a team of 20 people uh, that we're focusing on how to present a menu and F&I products. And, maximize the performance on that side or you know even a dealership that might be one price and and making sure that that one price model that they have on the front end that we still cater our our, our training and our best practices in f and i for the back end part of that as well so really uh, uh taking like i said some of the best practices that we have in the process is that we really perfect within a store and making sure that we fit it to the culture is very important thank you and Mike, um, since a lot of your role is, is going in and, and establishing those relationships, can you talk a little bit about how do you go, go about minimizing that disruption? I think we know like starting with a new vendor or new partner, there's change management, there's things that impact all sorts of de uh, uh, departments across the dealership. So um, how do we effectively navigate that for the dealership teams? Yeah, thanks, Amanda. You're absolutely right. I think the number one um, hesitation I get from a lot of prospect dealers or new to BJ and a uh, dealers is the change management aspect and um, just the fear of what could happen in their store when they change an F&I provider. And even on a most basic business uh, case of like a contract administration, you're still affecting multiple areas of the dealership. You have new and new sales, you have F&I, you have service department, you have accounting uh, that all interact with an F&I provider on a regular basis. Uh, so even if we're not coming in and changing processes out of the gate, just the fact that there's a new claims administration uh, number that they need to call and a set of team that they need to work with and the accounting department, there's an awful lot of change going on at any time. And I think one of the ways that we help mitigate that is we really front load our relationship and we have a large presence of uh, our field uh, sales reps on the ground. And a lot of times it's not uncommon for the first week of a store being launched to have three or even four or five associates be in a store to help touch all of the areas and make sure that they're aware of, uh, you know, the sales teams are aware of all the features and benefits and that the technology stack is integrated. Uh, that accounting knows exactly, hey, how do I get to my statements? Where do claims come in? Where do I post things? So it's really kind of giving them information before they need it. So they're comfortable with it by the time they do need it. And then obviously back in service, it's the same thing. Hey, uh, this is how you can self-authorize claims. If you can't self-authorize, this is how you can call claims in. It's very easy. Maybe even do a test call with some of the service writers so that they can see how easy the process is. So it's really just connecting with them on a human level in the store um, and kind of embracing them and letting them see how easy everything is, is the way we typically help navigate change management out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot to consider and a lot of teams, to your point, that are impacted by by a change. And so um, just lots of things to talk about and lots of people and roles and responsibilities to consider. And um, along that vein, Casey, how do you how do you work with the dealership teams to ensure once the relationship is established that there is consistency in processes and consistency in customer experience? Yeah, you know, I'm excited to talk more about leveraging technology. It sounds like that's that's on the minds of a lot of people. But I think that's what we, when a dealer partners up with us, that's what we really bring to the table for that dealer is to help 
manage and, and, um, and drive those processes and make sure that they're consistent. Uh, you know, sometimes a second voice, someone from outside the store that is still on the same page as the dealer or the general manager, or general sales manager, anybody uh, within the store, that second voice reiterating that is where we really see some of these processes and best practices stick. Uh, I think also when you think about training and ongoing support, there are some times that we send a, a newer F&I manager to a, a, a classroom type of, 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 of uh, training, and that can be great. But what happens afterwards when that person gets back into the store, uh, that ongoing support and that constant training is where we don't only just see the spike in performance after that classroom training, but we sustain it, if anything, continue to increase it. Uh, that's that's where we really bring the value for our dealers and 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 like I said, keep that traction and and have these things stick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great feedback. Um, and sort of building off of team alignment, I think we know um, in a dealership structure, right? There's the need for training teams, and we know that there's always turnover and the new talent to bring in and uh, existing teams to upskill. So. How big of a focus um, should that be for an F&I provider when they're working with a dealer? Yeah, I, I think this has been one of the, the areas that our dealers have shown the most appreciation from us over the last couple of years, because right now, good thing is there hasn't been a lot of turnover, especially in the F&I office, because people are making a lot of money and, and hopefully are very happy where they are. But we know there's always a need to grow people. And, and I think the, the most success that we've had here recently is growing people from within. Uh, I really like this because uh, sometimes if you bring from someone from the outside, they could bring some, some bad, uh, bad habits with them. And so what we really try to focus on with our dealerships, whether it's into F&I or even to the sales desk, is finding some high potential. We call them also the, a bullpen class and help uh, really grow these associates from within and give them the start that they need right right off the start. So um, that might mean having some classes that they go for just the paperwork part of it or uh, the DMS system. So that way, when that person does get that promotion, it's not just throwing them the keys and telling them to, to, to go get it. They're really prepared. And, and I can think of one group in particular that we work with that have had 11 associates promoted from the sales floor to the F&I office or to the sales desk. And a lot of times uh, they're, they're the top performers really early on in their career. Uh, so I think building that bench and, and, and addressing the, the turnover, if there is any, uh, is huge. And, and I think the last thing that, that we really like about this is it shows those salespeople that there's, there's growth within the organization. And if anything, we see them hone their skills as a salesperson and really watch their paperwork and, and increase their sales and know uh, what it takes to get to that next level. It, it's, it's been a huge value for our dealers. Right. And, and you talked a little bit about identifying who those top performers are and, and giving them opportunities to grow. Um, Mike, we know that a big part of helping dealers business and is helping them understand performance and profitability. Um, so how does that work? from a dealer owner's side, as well as from an F&I manager perspective? How are we helping them to track those key metrics to understand how their performance is impacting their profitability? So data is very important um, to managing objectives and ultimately driving performance in the store. But I think um, having too much data is just as bad as not having enough. So it's how do you collect the right KPIs and then put them in a format that's easy to digest and easy to understand um, and easy to make some clear conclusions out of the gate. And uh, we do that on the front end of the house and F&I and on the sales side with our scorecards uh, where we can, and we'll show some samples of these uh, later on in this webinar, but where we can benchmark them against similar stores, uh, where we can see trends, you know, are they trending up? Are they trending backwards? Uh, even trends on particular products. And I think these scorecards really help us uh, manage, you know, associates uh, along with dealership leadership in this store on a regular basis. Um, from a reinsurance standpoint or you know, a participation standpoint, we use experience reports to figure out what the insurance, the book of business is doing. And we talk to a lot of dealers that, uh, especially a lot of prospect dealers that will tell me that they're in reinsurance, but they don't really understand the funds flow and they don't really know how it's performing or they'll see one loss ratio and say, hey, I'm at 50%, I think that's great. 
Um, so I, I think being able to gather the KPIs from a reinsurance aspect and put them in a really easy to navigate scorecard is a, a huge benefit we provide to dealers on a regular basis. And then also show them, hey, as the money goes back out and claims are paid, where are the claims going and make sure that's easy to navigate and kind of dive down into as well. Yeah, having those that context and those insights has to be critical in, in supporting the growth and, and the business overall of a dealership. Um, and I know you said you wanted to share some of those scorecards, um, but before we do that, I think let's talk about the elephant in the room, right? Um, EVs are a popular topic uh, everywhere you go. So is that something that you factor in when you talk about performance or are you measuring it separately? Um, you know, I, I think what's the benchmark of good when you're talking about an ICE vehicle as compared to an EV? Um, can you talk a little bit about how we measure that? Uh, yeah, you know, EVs start a really interesting conversation because historically I haven't uh, spoken with any dealer yet that measures uh, EV performance and KPIs separate from ICE vehicle and KPIs. And the reason that's so interesting is a lot of new manufacturers, as they create these new EVs, they're actually changing the sales process a little bit. Um, you know, Ford is a great example where Ford's kind of splitting off and they're having a Ford corporation that does all of their ICE vehicles and a Ford corporation that does their EVs. And, you know, that wasn't a mistake. That was very intentional because I think manufacturers, as they push these new EVs, are trying to connect with the consumer a little more directly, um, which as long as we're as retailers still in the picture is okay. But I think we need to measure and make sure that we're in control of the, the sales process with the consumer on that. And being able to measure that is, is kind of one way. Uh, we actually just had a recent study that we did. And so far year to date, our EV performance is actually now outperforming uh, ICE vehicle performance, which I think came shocking to a lot of you know associates internally uh, within JMA. So we're starting to pull those out and measure those a, a little bit more than we had in the past. Um, but again, sometimes you're not just measuring the actual vehicles themselves because the process and the way we've engaged with consumers might be a little bit different. You know, the, they might have started online in the EV process and really just did a delivery in the store uh, or even an offsite delivery. Whereas the traditional um, ICE vehicle might have more of a makeup of the traditional linear sales process where customer goes in, looks at a vehicle, test drives the vehicle, negotiates the deal, and then drives away with the vehicle. Yeah, and Amanda, we, we really saw this take um, take place with virtual F&I as well. So we, we started, like Mike said, splitting off those virtual F&I deals. And, and we were able to really put that at the forefront of these F and I managers, especially during COVID. But that's really stuck here. And when we can judge that performance and make sure that they see the opportunities, whether it's a virtual deal, an EV, we know that there's new products that are out there that are going to be just perfect for those EV, uh, for those EVs. And and making sure that we still have those processes in play, uh, it's going to be important. And to making sure, like I said, that the, the F and I manager sees opportunity in every deal. We, we always say 100% uh, of the customers, 100% of the time, 100% of the products, and that's going to uh, be the same with DB as well. Great, thank you. Um, and I think um, next up, we want to start diving into how we're measuring some performance across dealerships. So um, let's start by taking a look at uh, one of those scorecards that you mentioned, Mike. Yeah, so I, I'm actually going to take this first one with uh, when it comes to just the performance of a dealership. So this is a nice one page scorecard that we like to review with our dealer. Uh, and we, we've been doing this a lot of times monthly, but a, a, you know, a quarterly review of this is really important. And uh, it, it gives them a nice snapshot of several different key components when we're talking about performance. And I, I think a couple of things stand out when we're looking at this scorecard, because let's face it, year over year performance is through the roof. Um, and especially if we go back to 2020, because it's about mid-year last year is when we really saw both the front-end profits and back-end profits go go through the roof. So, uh, but that doesn't mean that there's still not opportunity within the store or within a, a certain F&I manager. And we really like these scorecards because it can pinpoint some opportunities within uh, that that person or the store. And we're going to highlight a couple key ones. It, it, you know, sometimes, like Mike said, data is so important, but if you if you overdo it, it, it can become uh, not as efficient and effective. Uh, but a few things that we like to focus on, starting at the top there, is leakage. So 
uh, in this store, 5.9% uh, service contract leakage. And what we kind of determine leakage as is um, any contracts that aren't going into the reinsurance business for the dealer. And, you know, sometimes there are some carve outs because of an OEM relationship or a program. Uh, and we even uh, can help manage that for a dealer. But anything that is unauthorized by the dealer and, and being sold, we can pinpoint this within the leakage up here. And if we see a spike in it, we can address it very early for the dealer and uh, make making sure that we're uh, on the same page with F&I managers as far as what should be sold within the store. Um, over on the far left here, you can see some year-to-date numbers. And, and what really stands out in this store, they're doing a great job on the PPR. So over $3,300 per car, a, a really big chunk of that coming from product PPR, which we, we see sometimes, you know, the reserve income that, that sometimes can come from the desk or, or not, maybe not much involvement with the F&I manager, but the product sales, what are you doing to help maximize the profit on that deal? That's huge. And some year over year numbers, as you can see there. But what we like to also focus is on is some of the product penetration year to date numbers. And you can see here, Gap is the one product that's down year over year in, in this case. And, and uh, 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 across a lot of our dealerships nationwide, you know, customers have more money down, more equity in their trades. And so we've seen that product slip a little bit, but you can see the service contract penetration is up 12%, uh, maintenance is up and, and tire and wheels up as well. But what we also look at is some of the 80th percentile, some of our best performing stores out there based on some of the data that we have nationwide, but also uh, we can hone into certain regions uh, but this in particular for the Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram brands, the uh, service contract penetration at the 80th percentile is 62.6%. So based on this at 48%, we know there's still some opportunity to increase that service contract penetration along with, you know, maintenance, gap and road hazards. So as good as the dealership is performing on the PBR side, we can really get this in front of our dealer and show them where there's still some opportunity, but where we've really been utilizing this is with our F&I managers, because let's face it, sometimes we, we can uh, get pretty proud of our numbers and have a little bit of an ego, but if we can still show there's room to grow, and if we're not growing and if we're not uh, focused on uh, uh, maintaining these great performance numbers that we're seeing right now, if, if things do go a little bit back to normal with inventories and everything, we want to make sure that we're still doing the right processes to, to help increase and, and uh, at the very least maintain some of these great performance numbers out there. Casey, I think that's a really good point uh, when you talk about maintain this process consistency. Um, you know, I was speaking with a prospect the other day that wasn't quite this high, but was in the upper 2000s and they were only $1,200 a couple years ago. So in their mind, they are knocking the cover off of the ball, right? They're very excited and very proud about their performance numbers. But one of the things that I think everyone that I spoke to in the store could admit is their process probably wasn't as tight as it was before. Um, you know, obviously the demand has exceeded the supply, the numbers have gone up and everybody's happy about that, but they're not going back for upsells. They're not presenting all products to all customers. They're probably not doing an interview on the sales floor anymore. So it, it's kind of allowed some of the processes to get a little loose, which creates concern as soon as the demand catches up with the supply. And I think when you look at a store like this, uh, it's a perfect example where even on a high performing store, there's a couple little areas that you could still focus on and, you know, maybe uncover some process inconsistencies as you go. Yeah, Mike, and I, I think to, to wrap up the scorecard again, this is something that we typically put in front of the dealer, but in the majority of our stores, we do what we call monthly focus meetings. And that's where, like Mike was saying, we can really hone in on some of the specific processes or, Maybe uh, we find out that the cash PBR is a little bit lower than what we usually run because they're kind of, you know, moving the deal in and out quickly or uh, a service contract profit per, per product sold. We, we can see an extra couple hundred dollars that might be in that product. Those focus meetings, and, and it's really fun to see these because when we focus on something during that meeting and take away what we're going to be focused on later on that month or, or into the next month, by that next focus mean, we usually see that that metric increase. Uh, so this is a big picture scorecard, but you know the data really tells a good story and helps us uh, manage the objectives uh, with the F and I team as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. This is great context and just great perspective to be able to provide to a dealer and just to reinforce what you said. By all accounts, this dealer is knocking it out of the park, but 
seeing those little opportunities for growth um, can really make all the difference, especially as you mentioned, when inventory starts to regulate itself and um, you know, we need to focus a little bit more on process and can't rely on, you know, the industry being what it is. Um, having this information at hand is is really critical. Um, so let's take a look at maybe some of the some of the, more of the back end, some some reinsurance and and how the numbers relate back to uh, dealership profitability. Sure. So I think just like uh, with the F and I scorecard um, on the variable side in reinsurance, we've kind of done the same thing by taking a lot of KPIs that normally you would go through multiple pages, you know, have a session statement or something to try to extract. And then we put it at a really easy to read format. Uh, this particular example is an auto group. It looks like they have uh, five Hyundai dealers, three Chrysler dealers, a Chevrolet dealer and a Volkswagen dealership. So good, good mix of makes and models going into this book of business. Um, up on the left-hand quadrant, you can see they've written uh, into this book for quite some time. And it even looks like they have multiple reinsurance accounts that the funds flow through. Uh, so at a glance, you can see um, you know, what each reinsurance company is doing, what each dealership's doing, how everything's performing. And then on the bottom, you can even see by product over the years, how everything is doing and what the ultimate uh, projected loss ratios are going to be. Um, so there, there's a few things on here that I kind of zoom into and look at. Um, if you want to go, James, yep. So off on the left-hand side shows a total summary of that book of business. So in this book of business, they've written over 42,000 contracts, uh, which represented about 21 million in net written premium into this book. Uh, their current running loss ratio is 42%. Uh, and if they stopped writing into this book of business today, we project that would ultimately run out at 43%. So actually pretty close. Now off on the right hand side, I think this kind of tells more of a story and uh, from the outside looking in could even raise some questions. You see uh, Hyundai dealer number two has a loss ratio of 55%, whereas Hyundai dealer number five at the bottom has a loss ratio of 17%. I think some out of the gate might say, wow, that's a, that's a pretty big variance for the, um, you know, very similar uh, dealership. But I, th I think you just have to really go in and ask yourself some questions. Hey, it, are they in the same marketplace? Because a Hyundai dealer in one city that has a labor rate of 160 or $170 an hour is going to have a different loss experience than a Hyundai dealer that's in a marketplace where that same labor rate is 75 or $80. Um, the other thing you might need to ask or really look into is do they sell the same amount of used to new? Hyundai dealer number two might sell three used cars for every one new car that they sell. And if that's the case and their used car inventory has some Highline and some European and some, um, you know, large domestic trucks in there, that would absolutely explain why its loss ratio is a little bit higher than Hyundai dealer number five that might really only focus on new car sales and is doing a lot of uh, pre-owned sales just of the Hyundai make. Um, so again, you know, the numbers do tell a little bit of a story. It's not an absolute conclusion. It's just some things to guide and uh, kind of talk to the dealer about and have conversation around. I think as you dive further into it, you can see the claims too. Uh, we can go to the claim slide. Perfect. And if you look at the, the claims, uh, there's some highlights on here that, that we talk about as well. Um, you can see all of the claims, you can see the retention. And a lot of times we really focus on the zero to 60 day claim amounts, um, just because they're a little more, uh, a little more affected by maybe the used car center and buying the vehicles, sourcing the vehicles and doing a full inspection on the vehicles before bringing them into inventory. So as you can see over here on the right hand side, there's uh, some 60 day claims that have happened this year, one in January, um, one at the end of last year in December, uh, one in August. So kind of throughout the year. And there's some major uh, claim amounts that go with it, 11,000, 8,000 and 5,000. So a lot of times we work with our dealer partners and I'll drill down into this again. If you wanna just drill into it and maybe zoom that up, perfect. And then you actually see what the claims are. Um, you know, on this particular vehicle, it looks like there was some engine work and transmission work. Um, and one of them was, uh, you know, five 
uh, five months into service and 11 months into service. So the chance that there was a pre-existing condition is probably uh, pretty slim uh, that this was actual loss, um, but it allows a dealer to check in, get the repair order number and see who the technician was. And sometimes you might find some common themes that a lot of the claims are coming from one writer. Um, and if you do, you know, you guys can have some internal processes to adjust that. So it's all about having the data, being able to drill down into it and draw the conclusions necessary to make sure that your uh, reinsurance company is running at maximum efficiency as well. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I mean, that's a lot of information, but a great detail and really insightful that really gives the context and and tells a deeper story, you know, behind just reading numbers on a chart. So being able to drill down and kind of take a deeper dive into some of these dashboards that you've shown um, is really helpful in just giving more information and just showing the, the knowledge and perspective that you all bring and that you can share with dealers to help them understand how to optimize their business and really maximize performance across a number of different departments. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so I think we've seen through these dashboards um, how we can leverage technology to improve our business. Um, and I think another big shift in the last few years that we've seen is consumer buying preferences, right? So um, how do we help dealers respond to this demand for more technology, new widgets, new tools, um, as well as, as the shift in customers wanting to be able to choose how and when they're acting with, uh, interacting with a dealership and how they want their transaction to look. So how do we how do we support dealers in, in figuring all of that out? Yeah, so I, I, and it sounds like this was the number one topic when we pulled everybody. Uh, I think especially as performance has been so strong over the last uh, year, year and a half now, figuring out the virtual side of things and the digital retailing piece of it is something that a lot of dealers have leaned, us, uh, leaned on us for. Uh, it all started two years ago when COVID hit. And I think for, you know, five, 10 years, maybe we were talking about what does dig digital retail look like? We, we even kind of coined the French phrase, uh, modern retail. And, and we know how much time the customer spends online to do the research. And, and maybe it hadn't picked up uh, up until two years ago on um, how much of the process they were actually doing online. They were coming back into the store to take delivery typically. Uh, but we saw that change in a in a hurry when COVID hit, especially in some states like uh, like mine in New Mexico, when dealers were were literally shut down. And uh, we really had to figure out quickly how is virtual F and I going to work. And and based on some of the customer demands back then, we've seen a lot of that stick still, especially in a lot of rural areas. And just as important as a TO from the sales F and I within the store uh, through the brick and mortar pr uh, traditional process. The virtual F&I process is just as important. And it, we can't surprise a customer in the last part of the sales process with a, a menu over the phone or, or sending a salesperson out with the menu, making sure that we have the, the right processes in place vir for uh, virtual F&I or offsite delivery is really important. And I, I think for a long time, the hope was to maintain the same type of performance on virtual deals as we've done on traditional deals. But in the places where it's really working well, we've even seen that increase. And, and a lot of times we see the customer, if it's um, you know a, a virtual deal where they're at their own home, uh, a lot of times they're very comfortable and, and are a little bit even more open to a menu presentation and, and products. So we've been really happy with some of the performance on the virtual F&I side. Uh, I think also though, what we've realized over the last year or so, is uh, it really helps supplement dealerships with personnel needs. And for instance, if you uh, have a store that's uh, a, a rural market, maybe two, three hours away from a bigger metro market, and if you have the, the team in place where your, your bigger store in the metro market is able to take those virtual deliveries from your smaller store, we've seen a lot of success with that as well. Because let's face it, sometimes it's hard to recruit to those um, smaller towns and, and smaller stores, or you might have a, a sales manager that's wearing both hats. And, and if they get really busy, it can be tough to take the deal from front to, to back. So we have a couple of stores in particular, I can think of in New Mexico, that we implemented a what we kind of call a centralized uh, virtual F&I process, where 
their heavy hitters, their their high performers within one of their bigger stores actually take some of these remote uh, deliveries, and we've seen a huge impact in performance. One store in particular went up about $1,400 in their PBR and about 40% in their service contract penetration because we were following a, 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 an exact process to make sure that these customers were getting offered these products and doing it by some of our highest performing F&I managers. So, uh, and like I said earlier, tracking that performance and making sure that we see the opportunity on these offsite deliveries, it's really helped the bottom line for our dealers. Casey, if I could just chime in, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because I was just speaking with a, um, a hopefully a soon to be J M A dealer the other day, and they're in the Southern California market. They have five stores. They have one store out of state in a very remote, uh, smaller town, and because they don't have the same presence there and name recognition, they have a hard time retaining and keeping the same level of talent. And every time that they lose, you know, the F and I manager, they only do about 50 cars a month. So it's uh, only a need for about one person. And after they lose that person, while they're waiting to hire somebody else, they typically want someone from their main stores to drive five hours and stay there for a week to, you know, help fill in and uh, help the F and I department stay up and running. And virtual F and I, I was kind of going through them could be the, the perfect example because now you can take your highest performing F and I manager, right? Within the group, offer them more opportunities uh, up with more additional customers to present value to customers. And now you have your top person in the organization uh, virtually touching uh, everyone buying a vehicle there. So I, I think there's a lot of possibilities for this uh, as we see it. And I, I think it resonates with a lot of retailers out there because it, you know, there's a lot of buy sales happening and not all of them are all in the same area. So I think it's a, an opportunity we're going to continue to see. Yeah, I think this is a, a perfect example of, of taking something that's a challenge or a shift in the industry and turning it into an opportunity and not even just an opportunity to maintain, but an opportunity to improve performance. And to your point, giving more opportunities to your top performers and aligning people to the right roles. Um, and of course, when you make a process more efficient for customers, you have a happier customer. And I think everybody can agree that that's a win-win uh, for everyone. So um, yeah, I mean, so many great use cases for virtual F&I um, that, I mean, we could be here all hour just talking about that. Um, but why don't we move on then to um, to CRM tools and, and optimization and and how we can utilize technology in the best way and seeing it as an asset rather than a line item. So when I work with a lot of uh, new stores and we first come into the store, uh, it's very common that we'll go through and look at that. They have a lot of widgets that they've signed up with over the years. And I think one of the most important things, and we look through the lens of a technology should be a tool to help make a more uh, customer centric experience and to expedite the process. Um, it should not be another line item expense at the end of the month. And it's not, it's not too uncommon to see that they've signed up with two or three tools that maybe even do the same thing, digital retailing tools or F and I menus. Um, and they don't even know that they still have the other two that, right. They switch, they still have two more. They're not utilizing them or they have, uh, their tech stack is right. And they have exactly what they need, but the associates in the store, uh, might be newer to the store and no one's really an expert on it. So they might only use 15 or 20% of the capability. So a lot of what we do is go in and make sure that are we using the tools to the fullest of their capacity? Um, again, an effort to make sure we have a customer centric experience and that we can make the sales process um, quicker and more efficient for the customer. Um, so that's that is a very, very common thing is to evaluate the technology stack and making sure we're using it as a benefit to the consumer and the sales process instead of just being a line item expense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you you mentioned process, Mike, so that's a perfect tee up to, to the next item of, you know, how do you get F and I to align to your processes, you know, maybe as opposed to the other way around. Yeah. And I think this is uh, something that, that we uh, get asked a lot from our dealers and, and especially as each OEM seems to have their own digital retailing tool. Uh, we've, we've seen so many in the last five to 10 years 
either have some success or, or maybe some failures with it as well. So I think having an F&I provider that can really vet through some of those uh, technology tools and especially someone like us where we're partnered in, you know, almost 4,000 stores nationwide from single point dealers to, to bigger groups and even with some OEM relationships where we can see a lot of these tools in action early on and see which ones are having success and why and maybe which ones uh, uh, failed and, and which ones to steer away from. But finding that out and, and if a dealer is an early adopter to, to some of these tools, uh, many times we've gone and given them some one pagers on some of the different digital retail tools out there and really helped them install the process to make them successful. But I think the key is the ongoing training with it as well. And I think about uh, one of those stores I referred to earlier that has a one point of contact uh, process. And you can imagine, you know, having 20 to 25 different sales associates that are using Darwin to present F&I products. Ongoing training is so important to make sure that those products are being presented the right way, um, especially when we see the turnover that can happen on the sales floor. There's often times where each visit when we go to this dealer, they might have one or two new salespeople. And that's exciting for us. We, we like working with new people, uh, but making sure that, you know, we're not only helping uh, protect the F&I dollars with the digital retailing tool, we do encourage to have F&I introduced early in that process. But if it's not introduced the right way, sometimes it can create an early no in that process and make it even more difficult by the time it does get back to maybe a traditional F&I manager or within that, that uh, one point of contact process. So we've really been working hard with dealers to making sure that that process is, is efficient and, and maximize the F&I side of it. Yeah, I think that, I mean, you all make great points and there's just so much out there when it comes to technology that it can just get overwhelming or confusing. I know we have, you know, different OEMs have rolled out different digital retailing tools um, with varying degrees of success. And, you know, is it, you know, are you buying which tech stack, right? And what matches up with what and and having someone to support that result um, is can be really critical. Um, so just to, to move on to the next section, I know we've spoken a lot today about different tools, different soft skills, um, reporting and things that, that can impact a dealer's bottom line and provide that visibility that they're really looking for. Because at the end of the day, of course, the dealer wants to make sure that any investment they're making in technology and talent and process enhancements, all those things is contributing to their overall success. So can we talk a little bit more specifically now about how an F&I provider should help dealers enhance their profitability, maybe in a more direct way? Amanda, this is near and dear to my heart because it's probably one of the key conversations I have with a lot of our prospect dealers. Um, one of the first things we do is kind of dive into their existing reinsurance program. And I ask them what their fee structures are. And it's uh, overwhelmingly, many don't know the current fees that they pay their F&I provider. But there's an admin fee. Uh, there's typically a seeding fee, uh, which gets paid every time money goes into the reinsurance account. There is a claims handling fee that gets paid every time a claim is called into the call center and a claim is paid out. And then there's typically premium taxes, which vary from F&I to F&I provider, depending on where they're domiciled. Um, there is no good fees or bad fees. I, I think the most important thing that I talk to a lot of our prospects with as it relates to fees is you just want to make sure that whatever the set of fees you're paying, that you're getting uh, what you should be getting from that. If you need a uh, basic claims administration, you're not looking for people in your store, you're not looking for training and support, you're not looking for, you know, as Casey talked about earlier, maybe that uh, partner relationship, but more of just a very basic paper vendor relationship, that fee should be lower than if you're looking for a full service, all encompassing uh, training relationship and uh, F&I provider that provides that. Um, so again, there is no good fees or bad fees. It's just some may be higher than others. And you want to make sure that you're getting the value for the fees that you're paying. The other thing I think it's important to evaluate about your current book of business is, uh, you know, make sure you have a strategy for your reserves. At the end of the day, a reinsurance program is still an insurance program, no different than Geico or Progressive. Um, and insurance companies make money two ways. They make money on uh, underwriting income, which basically means the money set aside for claims 
after claims are paid, whatever's left is your underwriting income. And the other way to make money is by using all of those funds while claims are waiting to be paid out and making sure you have a good investment strategy. So I encourage a lot of our dealers, if they have a uh, current wealth advisor uh, or financial services advisor to connect with them. And you can typically diversify your funds that you have in these reinsurance companies so that your money's making money for you while you're waiting for claims to be paid out. Uh, it's all too common that we see a lot of dealers just kind of leave these in a cash management account that uh, doesn't get any interest or investment income. And it's simply money sitting there waiting for claims to get paid out. So I, I think that second way is make sure that your money is making money for you. And then uh, the final strategy that I think a lot of dealers also don't take advantage of fully is providing insurance solutions to their customers. Um, Amanda, if you have a store and you have you sell 200 cars a month, that's 200 times there's an insurance agent being called, whether it's a, an Allstate or a State Farm agent down the street or a call center like Geico. Every time someone is buying a car, they're either getting a new policy or they're changing an existing policy and there's insurance commissions being paid out. Now, um, if the dealer would like to help facilitate this process, a lot of times you can be the insurance agent and actually take advantage of these commissions. Um, there's another flip side that it's the right thing to do for the customer as well. If we can integrate insurance solutions with a good technology stack that makes it very easy for the sales associates and the customers, to get insurance quotes uh, while the customer waits to go through the process, many times you're able to save the customer money. I think on average right now, uh, we're saving about $64 a month in insurance payments. Well, when you're buying a new vehicle and typically people are spending a little bit more on the new vehicle than they did on their last one, an area where they can save money in the process doesn't come along too far. And when you can, really provides an additional benefit to the customer. So I, I think that's a, another income strategy um, that more and more dealers I, I'm kind of talking with and are open to exploring. Yeah, Mike, and if I can add on the, the last piece there, we, it sounds like a broker record when we talk about processes and making sure every, everything is really streamlined for that F&I process. And when we are talking about some of these insurance solutions, we've been uh, really working hard with dealers on when that takes place in the F&I process. The last thing we want to do is slow something down. We know how important that CSI question from when you say yes to getting into the F&I office. But how many times has a business manager gone out to do their interview with the customer and they're on their phone already with an insurance company and slowing down the process anyway? So uh, when, when we put it into the process the right way and the customer introduced the insurance piece of it to the, uh, to the customer the right way, uh, we can really make that streamline and if anything, uh, speed up the process while while uh, trying to capture some of that business for the dealer. Great point. Yeah, I mean, and I think that that's something that a lot of dealers aren't considering and, you know, maybe it's a relatively new um, addition to the market, but, you know, again, another opportunity to enhance the customer experience, save them money in addition to you know earning money a little bit on the dealership side, um, that's you know obviously a great opportunity across the board. Hey Amanda, um, yeah. If I can just tag on that, um, you sure. know, KC made a great point about process, and I think we talked a few slides back about some of the technologies that you know I see in stores that aren't being fully utilized and they're just an expense. I think this is an area where if there's not a process around it, it could become one as well. Um, if you get licensing and become an insurance agent but then aren't really offering it to your customers all the time, 100% to every customer every time, right? Offering those quotes. Now you've essentially just done the same thing you have with technology. You've created additional expense uh, because there's no solid process around it to KC's point. So you're never gonna get the returns uh, that you had imagined when you started that process. Great point. Um, and a great segue to, uh, to our next slide, you know, this whole conversation has really been about giving perspective, more perspective to dealers and thinking about ways that your F&I provider or partner should be bringing value to your dealership. So we want to just kind of leave you with these four questions. Uh, we know there are a lot of options out there in the marketplace. And so understanding what the right fit is for your goals can help you make an informed decision um, when you're thinking about F&I. So um, if you wouldn't mind guys just reviewing these questions and just giving a little bit of context behind where, why they're important. 
Sure, and and we're going to start off with people, and we know that you know Jamin A talks about it a lot on our side, and I know a lot of dealers that believe the same way is the associates are the big biggest asset within a store. So when you're uh, working with a provider, if you're thinking about you know signing up with the new F and I provider. Asking that question, what level of training and coaching and goal setting are you going to bring to my team? And and yes, JMA is an F&I provider. Obviously, we provide F&I products, but I think uh, we're probably better described as an associate development company. And that's where we put a lot of pride on what we do within these stores. And again, I referenced one of the, the dealer groups that we worked with earlier. When we can take a salesperson and develop them into an F&I manager or a sales manager, and, and we've even had some become GSMs, GMs, maybe even dealers in the future. We work with one in New Mexico that's now a dealer. And, and that's where we really kind of, I, I think we get the most pride from what we do. And I have several dealers that tell us, uh, that's why I partnered up with you, is that you bring that development to my team. And of course, we're, we're training a lot of uh, transactional type of behaviors and processes. But I think the coaching and, and leadership that, that we provide, but that help develop those teams into better leaders and coaches themselves is where we bring a lot of value. I think you need to ask about communication too. Um, you know, I would, I would want to know what the cadence of communication is going to be. Uh, how often are you going to do reviews about my performance with me? Are we going to talk about them, you know, weekly, monthly, quarterly on an annual basis? What data are you going to push to me? And is it going to be on a reactive basis act? after I've had to ask for data, or is it going to be on a proactive basis where you know the important KPIs that I want to measure and you make sure that stuff is in front of me on a regular basis? Um, so I, I think that has to do with, is somebody looking at the book of business regularly and consistently, and can they push the right level of communication down to you? Because I think communication and data, right? We talked about it earlier. Um, too much can be just as bad as not enough. So it needs to be the right level of communication with the right sort of data being communicated regularly. Yeah, and we talked a lot about technology. I think the biggest takeaway when it comes to technology is leaning on your provider to help you vet through some of those new tools and processes. And, and like I said earlier, if you're an early adopter, but you still want to know uh, any good success stories to some of these digital retail platforms, uh, lean on your provider. Lean, you know, so many of our dealers lean on us to, to help vet through some of those tools. And, and then ultimately come up with a good game plan from the beginning uh, to, to make sure that they have success with those tools as well. And finally, I would, I would ask about the partnership and the accountability component. How is your F&I provider going to be accountable um, to your success? I know on, on our end, um, you know, we tie the associate comp plans in the field to dealership actual performance numbers. And we do that. So that way, uh, you know, all of our field sales associates have a vested interest in our dealer's performance. Uh, there's regular KPIs that are pushed to our associates on a daily basis that show, hey, where's the goal for each and every store they're responsible for? Where's the current performance for each and every store they're responsible for? So we make sure on our end that we align to the dealer's goals. And I, I think that's a good question to ask your provider and you shouldn't be afraid to ask them. Uh, are they simply just counting contract sales at the end of the month? Or are they accountable for, um, you know, your financial growth and performance? Thank you both for, for that perspective um, and diving a little bit deeper in those questions to ask. Um, this has definitely been an action-packed uh, 53 minutes <laughs> uh, that we've had. And I know we've covered a lot of topics. So I would just ask anybody who's joining us, um, if you have more questions or want to have a conversation with us, we invite you to do that by reaching out to us. Uh, feel free to uh, go to our website, jmanagroup.com, and uh, click on our F&I dropdown. You'll see a lot more in-depth information there on, on how we support dealers nationwide. Um, and on there, you'll see a form and feel free to uh, give us your information and just a little bit more about yourself and how we can support you. And we'll be sure to reach out and uh, have a conversation with you about that. So thank you, Mike and KC, for all your insights and information. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate having you, and we will see you at the next Office Hours. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Have a good Thanks, day. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, everybody.